right, now we're going to look at chapter 23 over the cardiovascular and lymphatic diseases. So guys, with the cardiovascular system, we need to review that there are certain components that are part of it. One is that they have the heart, then we have the vessels, and then the blood. Now, the blood is made of plasma and cells. The plasma is the liquid portion, and the cells are going to be things like leukocytes, which are white blood cells, erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are platelets. Now, the heart is going to be the pump that pumps the blood through the body, and it pumps the blood through these blood vessels. These blood vessels are going to be arteries that go away from the heart and veins that go towards the heart. So the function of the cardiovascular system is to transport substances. Um, it's supposed to transport them to and from the tissues. So it's going to not just transport things like oxygen. It's going to transport carbon dioxide, which is a waste from the tissues. It's also going to transport um, nutrients like glucose, proteins, things like that to the tissues, and then also take the waste away. All right, so it's delivering good stuff and hopefully taking bad stuff away from the tissues. Now the lymphatic system has a few components as well. It is composed of lymph, which is the fluid, um, also vessels, lymph nodes, and, and the lymphoid organs. So when we look at this, guys, lymph is the fluid, and this is the fluid that gets co collected around your cells that needs to be returned to the blood, okay? We can't return 100% of this fluid back into the blood vessels, and so the lymphatic system is going to help with this, collecting it. In this process as well, it's also going to do some filtering. This filtering is going to be through the lymph nodes and the organs. These are going to be rich in lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, which are very specialized for your immune system. So they're going to participate in that immune response and hopefully trap potential invaders. All right, you'll notice that these lymph nodes are found in key locations, normally where um, a part of your body is going to merge with another part. So you can see them here in the cervical area, also in the axillary and like the armpit and the groin area. Okay, so these are just going to be in areas where we find a very large amount of lymph nodes. The lymphoid organs are going to include things like your tonsils, your thymus gland, which is a gland down here in the chest, the liver, the spleen, and then your bone marrow. Okay, and your bone marrow are part of this because they are the ones who make the lymphocytes. Now the function of the lymphatic system is to return this interstitial fluid, which is the fluid around your cells, back to the cardiovascular system. It does this through a series of ducts, and so the vessels are there to help return this back to the cardiovascular system. This is to help make sure that the plasma levels in the blood stay up and that your tissues don't get too swollen, which we call edema. So some terms we want to look at, and we have seen some of these terms before. Um, we have what we call septicemia. This is going to be where there's pathogens in the blood. We have sepsis, which is, which is intense inflammation response to an invasion. Okay, so sepsis is where your immune system is actually trying to fight the invader, but it's causing intense inflammation in the process. We also then have septic shock. This is a decreased blood pressure and a possible organ failure, and this can be due to toxins, okay? And especially what we call the endotoxins, when we've actually, your immune system's taking care of the invader, but in the process, they've released their endotoxins. Now recall from our previous notes that endotoxins are normally going to be produced by gram-negative bacilli bacteria. Um, gram-positive cocci can cause sepsis. This would be like your, your strep group B, which is causes neonatal sepsis. Um, this is one reason why pregnant women, before they give birth, they get tested for the strep B. Um, we also see strep group A, which can cause uh, purpural sepsis, which is childbirth fever, and then also enterococcus. And remember that enterococcus is a common healthcare acquired an infection. All right, so we want to talk a little bit about inflammation. We talked about this back in the um, nervous system chapter where we talked about inflammation of the meninges or the brain itself. Now we want to talk about this inflammation when it deals with the cardiovascular system. And in this case, it's talking about the heart. Um, endocarditis is where bacterial vegetation gets on the valves of the heart, which you can see here in this picture, which causes an inflammatory response on the inner part of the heart tissue, thus the endocarditis. Now there are different types. There's what we call the subacute. This is normally caused by an alpha strep. This usually is caused by your normal flora following dental work. So the normal flora in your mouth gets dislodged. It then ends up in the heart on these valves. There are some predisposing factors though. If an individual has a heart murmur, there's a higher risk that this could happen. And it's not as aggressive as acute endocarditis. Now acute endocarditis 
called is caused by staph aureus this has a rapid destruction of the heart valves and one reason why the destruction of the heart valves takes place is that the immune system tries to fight off the infection it tries to fight off the bacteria in the process it damages the t the tissues of the valves this causes the valves to not close all the way between the the chambers of the heart and so blood goes will backflow which causes your heart to not be as efficient we then see there's also what we call pericarditis pericarditis is inflammation of the membranes that surround the heart the heart is surrounded by a set of membranes that we call the pericardium this this pericardium is supposed to help reduce friction so that when the heart beats it does not create a lot of heat due to that movement Okay, when we see pericarditis, it's going to be inflammation of these layers um, that surround the heart and it can cause major pain um, every time the heart beats. Again, the main culprit bacterial wise for this is strep uh, pyrogen. So some other bacterial diseases that we can see that are with the cardiovascular system is rheumatic fever. This is a post strep group A infection, uh, tularemia, brucellosis, which is undulate fever, anthrax and gangrene. So let's look at the rheumatic fever. This is a post-strep uh, pyrogen's complications. Um, we see that it can start out as a simple strep throat infection. Um, it's important to treat this group A strep infection with antibiotics, and the main antibiotic we do use still is penicillin for this. Um, what happens though is that some of the bacteria gets dislodged, it moves to other areas, and this can cause the heart valve damage that we see with rheumatic fever, um, where the autoimmune reaction takes place. Antibodies are going to react with the antigen, which is the invader, but in the process it does cause damage on the tissues. Another is that it can happen in the joints and it can cause joint nodules or the, and a type of arthritis. Okay, so this is normally going to be a complication of a strep infection that starts out as strep throat but again spreads to other areas. Francisella tularensis is what causes tularemia. This is also known as rabbit fever. The reservoir is small wild mammals, in particularly rabbits, but other small mammals can also carry this. This means it's a zoonotic disease. It's carried in, in um, animals. This means it's a zoonotic disease. This can cause skin ulcerations that you can see here in the picture. This is the most common part of it and it causes these abrasions. However, it can progress um, to enlarge the lymph nodes if it's untreated. This can be followed by septicemia, which can cause major complications. The issue with this bacteria is that it reproduces in your macrophages, which are one of the main cells of your immune system. The treatment normally for tularemia is going to be tetracycline for about 10 to 15 days. So when we're looking at Francisella tularensis, if we're gonna grow it in the lab, a lot of times you see it here in, in colonies that have a milky white type presence. We also see that we can um, stain it using the um, fluorescent stain where we can see that it does glow um, with antibodies so this would be using the fluorescent antibody type of stain we do see that this is a nationally reportable disease and one reason for this is if we see it on the rise we want to be able to control the reservoir who is actually um, carrying it and this can include like again those rabbits or other small mammals um, one thing about this particular bacteria is it is fastidious meaning that it does um, have very very um, particular needs in order to grow and one of these includes the fact that it needs iron and this is one reason why it can grow on the chocolate auger because iron is being presented um, with the red blood cells that have been lice. These guys are tiny gram negative bacillus and they do show some bipolar. Bucillosis is also known as undulant fever. Um, this is going to be where the bacteria is usually transmitted to humans by contact with infected farm animals. These farm animals can be different species we see located here. So some more farm animals that can carry this um, bacteria would be things like cows, sheep, and even pigs. So these are going to be examples of some of the most common uh, bacterial zoonosis diseases. It's normally due to the ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products, um, especially like goat cheese, and usually it is imported goat cheese. It's endemic to some parts of the wor world, especially when we look at the Middle East. This is spread via the lymphatic system. It often becomes chronic affecting organ systems because of the fact that it phagocytic cells that are part of your immune system. This makes it a little harder for them to take care of it because they're invading the ones who normally would get rid of the bacteria. This allows for a long survival. The symptoms here are going to be up and down types of fever, malaise, night sweats, and muscle aches. 
we also see that long-term treatment is going to take place normally that it's going to last for about six weeks and it includes normally a combination of two antibiotics so these are tiny gram negative coccoid bacteria um, they favor intracellular growth they like to get inside of the cells who do phagocytosis of your immune system so special handling practices need to be used in order to transport these and also grow them in the lab and one thing is is they can actually get into the air very easily we see that serological testing is available, so we can look at the blood and tissue here because they like to get inside of cells. And again, treatment is long-term, six weeks with multiple antibiotics. So our next one is Bacillus anthracis. This is also this is what's going to cause anthrax. Um, this is an aerobic gram-positive bacillus. So again, you can see that it's staining here in the purple color due to being gram-positive. These are spore producers. Um, they with these spores guys these spores can actually stay dormant um, for years and years before they can become activated again they produce various potent exotoxins the virulent forms also produce capsules okay which help again with allowing them to invade our body two of the main potent to exotoxins that they do produce one is called an edema toxin this one causes edema and interferes with your macrophages in order for them to do their job in your immune system and then there's also a lethal toxin and this one will kill the macrophages okay so we have these macrophages coming in and trying to control the invader and instead the toxin that these guys release kill them or they can't do their job the reservoir is soil for this group um, they this is due to the fact that they can make very hardy endospores and their ability to be able to survive for a very long time grazing animals will ingest the endospores uh, vaccines are available for livestock their limited use on humans and the reason when we look at this the vaccines are there to target the toxins that they produce these particular uh, vaccines is where we see that they do six injections over 18 months now, going back to the idea that these are very hardy endospores, some of them have been seen to actually survive for as long as 60 years. Um, in that endospore state. So when we're looking at anthrax, the most common is what we would call cutaneous anthrax. This comes from handling of contaminated animal hides or wool. Um, this usually does not enter the bloodstream. It stays on the surface pretty much of the skin. And this is about 90% of the cases of anthrax. Um, it enters normally through um, minor skin um, lesions or cuts where openings in the skin have happened and then it creates these um, lesions on the skin. Now, the rarest form is the gastrointestinal anthrax. This is gonna be due to eating contaminated food products. The mortality rate though here is 50%, so it has a pretty high mortality rate, but it is a very rare form. This is normally due to consuming undercooked meat that has been contaminated. Now, the, high, the highest mortality form is called the pulmonary anthrax. This is where the individual inhales the endospores. Um, the mortality is close to 100%. So if this is what happens, then there's a high chance that the individual will uh, die due to this infection. If it's not treated with the mortality is close to 100% if it's left um, untreated. It needs to be treated with um, antibiotics and it needs to be done so quickly. If it is not treated, then the, the mortality rate is close to 100%. And it does have to be treated early. The problem is a lot of times it is not suspected. Therefore, that treatment window passes. So when we talk about anthrax, a lot of times you hear about it or you've heard about it when it dealt with um, anthrax being mailed in, in powder form to the Pentagon, people opening their mail and being exposed to it because they inhaled the endospores. This is one reason why they check and irradiate that stuff and they ask you those questions a lot of times of how, or what are you mailing now um, because they're going, they, they want to stop stuff like this from happening. Um, a lot of mail that goes to important individuals gets irradiated with radiation in order to potentially take care of any of these infectious spores that terrorists might use to put into the mail service or into other things. Now we have Clostridium perfringens. This is going to cause gas gangrene. Um, what happens here is that ischemia takes place. The tissue lacks a blood supply. This creates anaerobic conditions because we're not getting blood to the area, which means we're not delivering oxygen to the tissues. The tissue starts to die. This is called necrosis. When the tissue dies, this is going to create a very preferable environment for this bacteria. Toxins that are produced are going to promote necrosis even more. This is going to cause um, toxemia where toxins end up in the bloodstream. Um, these guys will ferment carbohydrates and produce gases. This results in swelling. That's why it's called gas gangrene. This gas is a combination of car uh, carbon dioxide and 
um, hydrogen. The treatment here is a hypobaric chamber, and one reason why they'll use hypobaric chambers is this increases the level of oxygen to the tissues. Since these particular bacteria prefer um, anaerobic conditions, when we increase the oxygen level, it, it decreases their growth and potentially can gas them out in a sense. We also see surgical removal of the dead tissue is important and possible amputation may take place. When we're talking about gangrene, a lot of times we have to amputate um, the tissue, especially bone is involved, um, and we have to go to where there's good tissue so that it can stop the spread of this bacteria. Also, this is a causative agent of some food poisoning and it causes complications in improperly performed abortions. So when this happens with abortions, it causes gas gangrene to develop in the uterus. So with Clostridium perfringens, remember these guys are obligate anaerobes, meaning they do not like oxygen. They need to be in an area where there's no oxygen present. These guys are also gram-positive bacillus. They do form spores, which you can see here on the end of the, in this picture. They are beta-hemolytic on reduced uh, blood auger. So our next group are diseases caused by bites and scratches. Pasturella multicida, this can happen from um, dogs and cat bites. It can also be um, passed on through human bites as well. It causes local swelling and pain in the area and it ca can cause forms of pneumonia and sepsis. We see that in this group, these are going to be gram negative, a cockoid type of bacteria. They do grow on blood agar in kind of a milky white colony. We do see that they have the catalase positive test, meaning they do contain the enzyme catalase. And they are also oxidase positive, meaning that they do um, utilize oxygen. They undergo, they undergo the process of aerobic respiration. So now we're gonna look at the group that's vector transmitted, meaning that's gonna be transmitted by um, something like normally an arthropod. We see that we have plague, this is Yersinia pestis. We also have relapsing fever, which is caused by a Borrelia. We have Lyme disease, which is caused by Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi. We also then see the rickettsia. The rickettsia can be endemic, can cause epidemic. It can also be endemic, which we say murian, and it also can cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So let's look at Yersinia pestis first, also known as the Black Death. So this is actually, the reservoir is going to be rats. Um, the flea is gonna bite the rat and, suck, and drink its blood. This is going to cause them to now carry the bacteria. The bacteria will multiply in the flea's gut. Once it has multiplied in the flea's gut, the gut gets clogged with the bacteria. The flea then will bite humans. It regurgitates some of the blood into the hope and wound, which then causes the human to become infected. Now, there are three different types of uh, the plague that we see here. There's the bubonic plague, the septicemic plague, and the pneumonic plague. Now, so the reservoir here are rodents, and in this case, it shows you the rats, but the vector is the flea. Now, bubonic plague is actually the most common. This is going to include 80 to 95 of the cases of the plague. So when we're looking at these, here's showing you the three different types. You have the bubonic plague. Again, it's the most common form. The mortality rate when it's untreated is between 50 to 75%. This creates what we call buboes, which are going to be the swelling that happens in the lymph nodes. And in the case, it's gonna be in those areas where there's a lot and under the arm is one of the main areas. We then see the pneumonic plague. This is gonna be transmitted person to person. The mortality rate is 100%. Um, you only have about 12 to 15 hours of the onset of the fever to fight this. And so normally we don't get treatment in that 12 to 15 hours. That's why it has a normally 100% mortality rate. We then have the septicemic plague. This can lead to septic shock. However, it can also then progress the pneumonic plague. So when we're looking at plague or um, Yersinia pestis as we're growing it in the lab, you can see here that when it's grown on um, in the case here, when it's grown on a plate, it creates these kind of sticky colonies. You can see that here when we see the loop is being pulled up from the colonies and it's sticky. Okay, it has that kind of structure to it. We also see that we can use a negative stain, which shows us the capsules. We can also see that you can use the fluorescent antibody stain and see um, when we have the antibodies to test for that particular strand of plague. We also see it has a gram stain. It causes tiny gram negative cocobacillus and it can have bipolar stains. When we do the bipolar stain, it looks like a safety pin. So the next group here is the relapsing fever caused by Borrelia species. Um, this one is a spirochete. You can see it here. Normally when we're looking at bacteria, a lot of them are what we would consider cocci round or bacilli, which is the rod. In this case, it's a spiral. So this is a spirochete. We see that it's going to have the reservoir in rodents. 
okay it's going to be carried by a soft tick so again similar to what we saw with fleas biting the animal and, and sucking the blood we see that the tick will do that on the rodent and then it gains access to the human the Borella likes to reside in the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and the central nervous system in humans. It creates high fevers. Each episode is less severe, and the treatment normally for this is going to be tetracycline. Okay, and this is one reason why it's called relapsing fever, because the fever comes back. Okay, again, though, each time it comes back, it is less severe than the time before. We do see relapsing fever does make a surge in the summertime months, and this is due to the increase of activity of the reservoir as well as humans outside. Borrelia burgdorferi is what causes Lyme disease. This is the most common tick-borne disease in the United States. It is also a spirochete. We see here the reservoir is field mice, um, but deer can maintain the disease in the population. However, they're not affected by it. And again, the vector here is going to be tick. So when we're looking at Lyme disease, the first stage causes a bull's eye type of rash around where the bite took place from the tick. This also is going to be accompanied by flu-like symptoms. It's important to treat it in the first stage of the disease if at all possible. It does not provide immunity, however, when we give treatment at this stage. In the second stage, we see that the heart becomes involved and there's also some neurological symptoms. Um, the patient may actually need a pacemaker due to the heart damage that can take place. In the third stage, it progresses into arthritis arthritis and joint damage. This does provide immunity against reinfection. So if the individual is able to, even though it progresses to the third stage, if the individual is able to fight off the disease, they then are going to have immunity against it in the future. So if they were, if they do get bitten by a tick later that's carrying Lyme disease, they will not develop the disease again. The diagnosis for this is using serological testing. So the next one we're looking at is rickettsia. This is an obligate intracellular parasite, meaning it has to gain access into a cell in order for it to divide. We see that this can cause an um, epidemic typhus fever. Um, the vector here is body louse, which is like a type of lice. We see the reservoir comes from squirrels. It's associated um, with unsanitary crowded population. Um, if it's left untreated though, it has a very high mortality rate. It does have a very high fever that can last for up to two weeks. It then invades the blood vessels and starts to block them off, which causes tissue damage and death in to the organs that those blood vessels um, are supposed to service. Um, it is reported that Anne Frank died from typhus fever. We also see endemic murine typhus. The vector here is the rat flea. The reservoir is going to be rodents and particularly mice. Symptoms are similar to the typhus fever. However, the mortality rate is very low. So we see the symptoms are still the same, high fever, things like that. We do don't see that it actually starts to cause lots of tissue damage and or potentially organ failure. Another rickettsia that we see is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. The vector here is the tick. The reservoir is also ticks and in some small mammals. So one thing about this particular one is it does get passed down though. When the tick ends up laying eggs and produces more ticks, they are also infected. This is called transovarian uh, passage. We also see that this can cause a macular rash. Um, this macular rash is weeks after the bite actually takes place, and this is why it has the spotted type of name, and it also comes along with a fever. There is a low mortality rate with this, and so when we see here in this particular picture, it's showing you where cases of this Rocky Mountain spotted fever does take place, and one thing that I found very interesting with this from the years 2000 to 2007 is that it really was not an issue in the Rocky Mountains. Okay, it is a little bit, but if you'll notice the Rocky Mountains run across um, in the, the southwest up through Colorado and New Mexico, and there's not near as many cases of them as you actually would see more in like Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, that sort of thing. So the next section we want to look at is the viral diseases of the cardiovascular lymphatic system. So some of the viral diseases um, contain Burkitt's lymphoma, infectious mononucleosis, cytomegalovirus, and hemorrhagic fevers. These hemorrhagic fevers can include things like yellow fever, Ebola, and hantavirus. So when we're looking at Burkitt's lymphoma, this is linked to a prior Epstein-Barr viral infection. Um, this is a mosquito-borne malarial infection that happens. And what happens here when we're talking about the mosquito-borne malarial infection is that the malaria starts to actually weaken the immune system. When the immune system is weakened, it then allows the Epstein-Barr virus to resurge. When it resurges, this is what causes the damage. This is the most common childhood cancer in Afri Africa because what it does is it resurges in the lymph nodes in the neck area. 
This is very rare in the United States, but we have seen it in AIDS patients. Okay, so when patients who have um, been diagnosed with HIV and their immune system gets so compromised and it then progresses into AIDS, we do see that this could potentially be a complication for those patients. The next group is the infectious mononucleosis. This is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus infection. Transmission is through saliva, so this is why it's also known as the kissing disease. Now, this does not mean you have to kiss somebody to get it. It could be simply sharing a drink with somebody through a straw. Um, it could be um, using the same utensils like a spoon or a fork. Um, in children, we see that mononucleosis is going to be um, asymptomatic. Um, symptoms are most pronounced in young adults ages 15 to 25, and this is due to the intense immune response that their body has against the invader. Mononucleosis causes fever, fatigue, sore throat. It will even cause swollen lymph glands in the throat area. However, it can spread from the throat area. If it spreads, it can um, get lodged in the spleen. This can cause inflammation of the spleen or what we call splenomegaly. Um, when this occurs, it's important to limit the vigorous activities of the individual and this is to help reduce the chance of rupturing of the spleen. The spleen is a reservoir of blood and so if it does rupture, the patient can bleed out very quickly. Most people actually have antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus by the age of 50. So most people have been exposed by the age of 50 to mono. So if you take a look here when we're looking at um, kind of a flow chart in the sense of the age that is going to be symptomatic for Epstein-Barr virus. You'll see that it's in a box here and it's between the ages um, here. It shows you 11 to about 25 and this is going to be the symptomatic stages of Epstein-Barr. Um, quite a few people though do get exposed before the age of 11 and it is asymptomatic. They don't actually have symptoms too. So with infectious mononucleosis, we can do a rapid serology test and this is available for diagnosis. What it uses is we take a sample and then we put some specific antibodies in it and if it if it changes color it shows us that it's positive for Epstein-Barr. We also can do a peripheral blood smear and we're going to look for atypical lymphocytes. These atypical lymphocytes look different and they got the name of downy cells. This is due to their lobed nucleus. The next virus we want to look at is the cytomegalovirus. This is also known as CMV. This most most individuals have actually been exposed to, um, before their 20s. Um, there are no to mild symptoms here present normally for cytomegalovirus. The transmission though is through bodily fluids. The at-risk populations are the immunocompromised. Um, this is because once it gains access, it can progress into other areas of the body, causing potentially encephalitis in the brain. It can also cause retinitis, which is inflammation of the retina in the eye. It could even progress into pneumonia or cause gastroenteritis in the stomach or intestines. Now, another issue though of a at-risk population is a developing fetus or newborn. If the mother is, has her primary exposure during pregnancy, it increases the chance of mental retardation and hearing loss for the baby. So if we look here, it shows you the picture of the cytomegalovirus is passed to the fetus through the placenta, and we see that it can potentially cause major issues. So when we take a look here, this one has the box around, if we're looking here in the um, 16 to normally 50 area, and this is going to be why we put the box here is it's important to test pregnant women to see if they have the antibodies against CMV. Okay, if they do not have the antibodies against CMV, it means that their first exposure could be when they are pregnant, which causes, again, those major issues for the developing baby. This shows you the picture of the cytomegalovirus. It is an enveloped virus. Um, when we look here, the cytomegalovirus nuclear inclusions can happen when they gain access. This creates a type of halo, which gives it more of an owl eye look to the cell. All right, so the cell, when we see here, um, starts to swell and creates this owl um, eye type of structure. We then have hemorrhagic fevers. Hemorrhagic fevers include things like yellow fever. Yellow fever is an arbovirus. Um, we see the vector is going to be a mosquito. Um, the last case in the US was in the 1900s. And more specifically, in the in 1905, we see this is due to the vaccine, which does does provide good immunity against it. Um, we see that there it is endemic into certain areas of the world, and if you'll notice, it's parts of Africa as well as um, South and parts of Central America. It does cause fever, chills, headache, nausea, vomiting, vomiting, and we see that the yellow comes from the damage to the liver. It causes yellowing of the skin. This is due to the bile being deposited into the skin and the mucous membranes. 
The next one is Ebola. When we look at Ebola, this particular virus is going to weaken vessel walls. This causes extreme internal bleeding. In 2014, we saw an emergence in the United States of this, and this is due to air travel, the fact that we can have air travel to lots of different areas. Um, it is, Ebola is still limited to parts of Africa. However, again, it can potentially travel out of there due to that air travel. Um, we do see that it has a nine, high mortality rate of 90%, and it is transmitted in body fluids. Okay, it actually can cause a hemorrhagic rash, which appears over the entire body. And, and in the late stages of, of this hemorrhagic fever, it actually does have bleeding out of pretty much every opening. This includes ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and so on, as we have the massive internal bleeding that takes place. This also means, though, that blood is coming out, which exposes other individuals to the virus. We then see we have hantavirus. Hantavirus, when we look here, um, is carried by deer mice, and it's actually found in their droppings. And so what happens is it's not actually the mouse that um, the mouse's presence that's the problem, it's their droppings. And so what you do here is when individuals, when the mouse droppings are in the garage or whatever, we don't normally see them, and if you start sweeping the area, it gets put into the air through dust. We then breathe that in, okay? When we breathe that in, that is what causes the infection of the hantavirus in our lungs. It is frequently fatal because fluid starts to fill the lungs. It also is going to cause renal failure as well. This causes massive edema and swelling and particularly in the lung area. The main form of treatment for hantavirus is going to be um, putting the individual on a respirator. The respirator is going to assist them in their breathing as well as we need to give them some antivirals um, to try to help fight this off. Okay, remember with viruses we cannot kill them off in a sense because they're gaining access into our cells to reproduce produce. The antivirals help deal with the symptoms and so this is going to help with the swelling and the edema. The next group we're going to look at are the protozoan diseases. With the protozoan diseases, we have we have Chagos disease. This is ca this is caused panosoma, which is a flagellate. We also have toxoplasmosis. This is caused by Toxoplasma gondii, which is a sporozoan. We also have malaria, which is caused by a plasmodium, which is a sporozoan, and leishmaniasis, which is caused leishmania, which is a flagellate. Now, one thing to note about these protozoan diseases is all of these have very, very complex life cycles, which we're going to kind of look at in a couple of the slides. So Shagog's disease is going to have its, it's going to have its reservoir in rodents and possums. The vector is a reduviate bug, also known as the kissing bug. Transmission is when the bug actually bites, and it bites normally around the face and the mouth because it is attracted to carbon dioxide. This is why it's called the kissing bug. What it, bug, what it does is it then bites and then defecates while it's feeding. When it defecates, that's where we see the protozoan is going to be released. It then enters the skin when we scratch at the, the potential bite. This is a, a trypanosome. It is a hemoflagellate, which means that it likes to be in the blood. This is going to be found in Central America and South America. It kills about 50,000 people annually. Um, some chronic cases are difficult to treat. It can ultimately damage the nerves uh, controlling peristalsis, which is which is movement of the food in the uh, GI tract or digestive system. When we look at Shagzogs, again, it is going to be endemic into most of the countries of South America as well as Central America up into Mexico. We have seen that it has reached as high as Illinois in the United States. So Toxoplasma gondii is also a protozoa, but it is a sporozoan, meaning it does not have any way to move on its own. We see that it has a required host. This required host is the cat. The cat is the carrier, okay? It needs to be into that host. What we see here then is it creates oocytes with thin leaves in the feces of the cat. It's transmitted via the cat feces. This oocyte is going to then be um, transmitted into rodents. It can also get into pigs, lambs, or chickens, and we see that it can um, transmit to humans through the raw meat of those animals, and they're an intermediate host. We also see that humans can be infected due to um, cleaning out the litter box and being exposed to the cat feces itself. It has no to mild symptoms for the most part, but there are some individuals who are at risk. These include the immunocompromised, and so with their immune system being decreased, it makes them at a higher risk of developing symptoms, as well as newborns. This can actually cause a neurological and vision impairment. 
we see that this is one reason why when um, women are pregnant, if they have cats, a lot of times the doctor will tell them not to clean out the litter box. There's a good chance the cat could be a host for this protozoa. We do see that there are serological tests available for um, this protozoa. So guys, when we're looking at this, the whole idea of it potentially being transmitted to the fetus is that a fetus may contract a toxoplasmosis through the placental connection, meaning that it can transfer across the placenta from the infected mother. The mother may, may be infected by improper handling of the litter box or ingesting some contaminated meat, which then means it can pass on to the child, potentially causing neurological damage as well as vision issues. So looking again at this chart, the toxoplasmosis is going to be marked here in the black. We see that there is a 20 to 40 percent of the population between the ages of 21 and 50 who have antibodies, which means that this would, be, would not be the first exposure um, to the disease. The next group is the plasmodium. This is going to be a protozoa that's also a sporozoa, meaning it cannot move on its own. Um, this is going to be carried by a specific species of mosquito. This is the Anophilus mosquito. We see that this causes spells of chills, fever, and headaches in the individual once they have been infected. The reservoir, though, is humans. Humans are the ones who um, continue this process. The way that it moves, though, is through mosquitoes. The way we diagnose the plasmodium is looking for the presence of the sporozoa in the blood. Okay, and so it starts to cause blood cells to look like what you see here. The timing of the draw though is important because this does have a very complex life cycle and we actually only and we actually only see these sporozoas during certain parts of the cycle. We see that there are different species here. We have the Plasmodium vivax is relatively asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms. So this is actually, what a good thing is, is this is actually the most prevalent form. Plasmodium ovale is relatively asymptomatic as well, but it is not as prevalent. We also have Plasmodium malarial A. This is relatively asymptomatic as well, but not as prevalent. The last group is the Plasmodium fasalparum. This is the most symptomatic and it has the highest mortality rate if it's left untreated. This is also known as black water fever because it causes dark urine due to the red blood cells being hemolyzed, meaning they're being broken apart. Then we see that the red blood cells are leaving in the urine causing it to be dark. So guys, we see here there is a geographical distribution. Um, cases in the U.S. are due to travels to or from these endemic areas. All right, so we see that most of these endemic areas are going to include, um, so the endemic areas are shown here in kind of the um, tan color. We do see that they have spread to other areas, and again, this is going to be due to travel. Uh, there is a prophylaxis, meaning that there's something we can take to help with this. This prophylaxis um, to help prevent um, you from from gaining this protozoa. This is chloroquine. Chloroquine, it does have, however, some psychiatric side effects for some individuals. These side effects include depression and hallucinations um, that can last years after the use of this proactive type of treatment, this preventative type of treatment. If you are infect, infected with a plasmodium, the treatment is anti-malarial chemo chemotherapeutic agent. So guys, this is the malaria life cycle. I told you that most of these protozoans have a very complex life cycle and so far they have been semi-complex, but this one is very complex. So if you take a look here, it's showing you that in the red, this is the mosquitoes part of the life cycle. The mosquito is going to bite an individual who has been infected with malaria. Okay, and so what happens here then is it starts this process of reproducing in the mosquito. This is the mosquito stage. When the mosquito bites an uninfected person, it's going to inject some of these sporozytes. These sporozytes then are going to enter into the bloodstream. When they enter into the bloodstream, they are going to travel normally to the liver. These are the liver stages, and these guys like to hide out in your liver cells. This is one thing that's important, though, is most of our anti-malarial medications do not treat the when, treat plasmodium when it's in the liver cells. It's only when they're out in the blood stage that the treatment normally takes place. Once they're out in the blood stage, though, we see that these are going to reproduce as well. Again, hopefully being able to be picked up by a new mosquito and carried to somebody else. Okay, so we see here it can be sequestered in the liver followed by released then into the bloodstream. This is one reason why blood draws are important at certain times because if it's in the liver, you're not going to detect it versus when it's in the bloodstream. Now, I have read a study about this where they were looking at malaria and they found that mosquitoes are actually attracted to people who are um, already infected with malaria. Um, this is due to the fact that they give off some sort of chemical that attracts the mosquito. Once the mosquito has been infected with the malaria, it has the sporogenic 
cycle going on. It now is attracted to individuals who do not have malaria, and this is to keep the life cycle going, to pass it on. And most of these mosquitoes, guys, they do three blood mills before they actually lay their eggs and die. And so this means if they bite somebody, if they, if they get malaria in the first bite, they could potentially infect two other people before they actually die. The next disease we're going to look at is leishmaniasis. This protozoa is flagellated, meaning it has a flagella present. Um, this is leishmania, has a variety of species. Um, the vector here is the sand fly. It is smaller than a mosquito, so a lot of times this actually can get through mosquito nets and still cause um, this disease to be present, even when mosquito nets are used in a lot of countries. We see diagnosis is through scrapings from the superficial lesions that are caused um, by this protozoa. The reservoir is small mammals, they're the carriers. Again, the vector is the sand fly and it is transmitted through the blood. So when we're looking at leishmaniasis, there's the cutaneous form. This is the most common. It causes ulcerations on the skin, but these ulcerations actually go so deep it does cause scarring. This is also known as the oriental sore. It can also be seen in a mucocutaneous form. Um, this is gonna get into the mucous membranes, and this can be disfiguring like you see here in this individual's nose. The visceral form is also known also known as Kala Azar, it's often fatal in one to two years. Now the visceral form means that it's getting into the internal organs. We do see this is endemic in southern Europe, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and also some other areas. We see that U.S. troops were actually exposed to this in the Persian Gulf, um, and we saw high um, cases as well. Now we're going to look at the helminthic diseases. So these are going to be the worms. Okay, what we're looking at here are going to be, we have schizosomasis, which is caused by a fluke, as well as swimmer's itch, which is also caused by a fluke. And remember that flukes are going to be flatworms, which are part of Platia hementhes. Schizomasis is going to be caused by a fluke. Remember this is Platia hementhes, a flatworm. Um, the infective stage is shed by a snail. Um, it is the required intermediate host, so snails have to be part of its life cycle, and then it enters our skin through abrasions or openings. Um, the prevention of this is going to be through good sewage and water treatment plants, because the, if it has contaminated water, this is how it's going to gain access. Once it gains access through these abrasions, it's going to then migrate via capillaries into certain organs, especially the liver, bladder, intestines, or the lung. They normally get named as a liver fluke, bladder fluke, lung fluke, or so on, based on which area they end up in and they start to reside. So in this case, you can see the liver fluke, and it does cause a major edema and swelling in the abdominal area with individuals who have it. So here's the life cycle, again, very similar to the protozoans where they have a very um, complex life cycle. We ID it by its egg form. Um, this can be found in urine or feces. It then is going to get into the contaminated water and then into snails. Once it's in the snails, it then can be released and it can penetrate the skin. Once it penetrates the skin, it's then gonna travel into a particular area. Again, this depends on where it would like to thrive, whether it's the liver, the lung, the bladder, and so on. Then the process then can continue. It will migrate back um, to the intestines in order to undergo um, sexual reproduction or the bladder, and this is where the eggs then get shed again, and it continues the process. However, the snail is a required host in this case. Now the species of snail that actually carry this are not found in the United States. The last thing we want to talk about is swimmer's itch. This is a rash caused by an allergic response to a fluke. This fluke burrows into the skin after swimming in infected waters. So the water has the fluke present, it burrows into the skin, and then it causes this kind of reaction to take place. And it is an allergic reaction, that's why it's part of the lymphatic and cardiovascular system. It's found deeper in the skin, so the itching subsides with time. Um, we do see that humans are the dead-in host, meaning that these guys don't actually want to get into humans. Um, the blood fluke that infects birds and other mammals is what causes this, but they do not actually want to be inside of us. And so this is why we're a dead-in host, and it only causes that allergic reaction to take place. This means we are unintentionally infected by this. All right, so this finishes up our cardiovascular and lymphatic diseases. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.